This is Earth. The planet Carl Sagan once called the Pale Blue Dot. The only planet that we know of to house intelligent life. We are humans. We are intelligent creatures. We look to the stars, and we build civilizations. But what makes us intelligent? What separates us from something else? Is it science? Music? But are there other intelligent creatures? The tame and obedient dog? The curious cat? Other primates that can learn to communicate through sign language? More importantly, can we recreate that intelligence that we see in man in a machine? If you were forced to give a definition or to conceptualize it visually, what might you first think of? Robots? <laughs> this is not that far from the common understanding of AI, and there's a good reason for that. In the 1940s and 50s, when the AI was first being developed and conceptualized, it immediately was attached to the field of robotics in pop culture. Why? Because for people who did not understand how AI worked, they attached it to what they knew. And what they knew was science fiction. And in science fiction, robots were AI. But this could not be further from the truth. So what is AI? The truth is there isn't one definition, but the one we're going to use is the automation of an intellectual task by a machine. Within this definition, there are three kinds of AI. Artificial narrow intelligence or weak AI, this is what we do now. This is AI that can perform a single task. There's artificial general intelligence or strong AI. This is a machine that can produce human-like intelligence and perform any task. We're not there yet. And finally, there's artificial super intelligence. This is the AI that will surpass human intelligence, and this is the one that most people fear. And the one that Stephen Hawking once famously said, we've got one chance to get it right. So how do you teach AI? How does AI learn? Well, there's two kinds of AI. There is symbolic AI, or good old fashioned AI. And for this AI, we hard code information into the machine. And this is the AI that was popular in the 1950s, up until the 1980s, and even into the 1990s. The other way in which we train an AI and teach it is through machine learning. This is where we are now, and this is what we are exploring today. To understand modern artificial intelligence, we need to jump back. Back in time, back to the 1830s, when the first computers were being invented and experimented with. And yes, I said 1830s, not 1930s. We're going across the great big blue ocean, and we're going to a little place called England, specifically Cambridge. And we're going to be looking at the social circles around the intellectual elites of Cambridge in the 1830s. Our story begins with a man named Charles Babbage, who was Cambridge educated and a mathematician. He would go on to be a professor of mathematics at Cambridge, where he spent a lot of his time developing the engines, what he called them, to make calculations through machines. He was tired of seeing mathematicians making silly mistakes when trying to write functions and get a certain output, and his idea for a machine that could do it would become the grandfather of modern-day computers. But it wasn't just Babbage's intellect in the idea of mechanizing mathematical problems to get a consistent and correct solution. When he was sharing these ideas with other intellectuals and aristocratic elites at soirees and music rooms like this, he met a young woman named Ada Lovelace. And it is to her that we must grant much of the appreciation for the modern-day computer. 
Ada was the only legitimate child of the famous British poet Lord Byron, the bad boy of his day, that someone once said was Sean Bean rolled in with Alec Baldwin. That's an image for you. She was educated in mathematics and not the arts because her mother feared that she would go the same way as her estranged ex-husband would go and become infatuated and distorted through the arts. And so Ada was trained in mathematics, and it is that background that gave her the knowledge necessary to engage with Charles Babbage at these parties the way no other members of this aristocratic elite really could. And she looked at his analytical engine that was capable of making these calculations, and she boldly claimed that if put to practice, that same machine could do incredible things, intelligent things. It could make music. Now this was revolutionary for the time, very out of place, and Babbage himself did not really realize all that she could do with this. Ada would spend the rest of her life thinking about that engine and its applications to the world of science and mathematics and music. And she translated a paper written by an Italian scholar on Babbage's engine. This Italian scholar was named Luigi Menabria. And she translated it, and while translating this article, she had copious amounts of notes. And one of her notes is the famous one called Note G, in which she goes through and develops the first known algorithm for computational numbers. And she does this specifically for the ability to calculate what are known as Bernoulli numbers. That is Ada's true legacy to the history of artificial intelligence. She is the one who recognized that machines could be put to practical use and solve bigger problems than just making simple calculations. She is the one who wrote the first computer program down on paper. Now, let's jump to the 1930s and meet a man named Alan Turing, probably the most responsible individual for the modern-day computer. Alan Turing was a mathematician, and he would revolutionize the field of artificial intelligence and computers during his lifetime by arguing that a machine could perform multiple tasks, not just one, and solve difficult problems that were unsolvable by man. In other words, Alan Turing laid the groundwork for AI. It all started in 1936 when Turing published a paper on computable numbers. And this paper, he argued for what we now know as the Turing machine, a programmable computer that could change its functions depending upon what the user wanted to see performed. In other words, he conceptualized and implemented the idea of a modern day computer, but it wouldn't come to reality until much later. During the mid 1940s, World War II broke out across Europe. And for those of you who've seen the imitation game, already are familiar that Turing switched his research from academic to wartime purposes for decoding, among other things, the Enigma machine used by the Germans. And he was able to take his concepts of a programmable machine and put it to a single task. Or he was able to engage in what we call good old fashioned AI, also known as symbolic AI. And this is because he was able to get a machine to perform the intellectual task of cryptography much more efficiently and much more possibly by a machine. Turing's vision was not really implemented until the late 1940s and early 1950s when the first computer started to be developed that could actually run what we now recognize today as programs. And these programs were viewed in neurological terms and headed by neurological departments, such as the one in Manchester. And the reason why is because early scholars viewed this artificial intelligence through a lens of neurology, because they saw it as performing tasks that occur inside the human brain. In the 1950, Turin writes another paper that he spent about a year writing, and it wasn't fully published until 1968 because it was scoffed at by the academic community. What he argued was that if you built enough circuits, you could create human-like intelligence in a machine. And in fact, and this is the big deal, you could teach a machine to learn. And he argued that the way in which you could test this, which is now known as the Turing test, was to see if a computer could talk like a human and fool another human. In other words, could a machine replicate something as difficult as human communication? 
This is really the birth of the modern AI theoretical application of machine learning. And in 1952, we start to see scholars begin to experiment with these ideas. A.S. Douglas creates OXO, which is able to play the world's first video game, a game of tic-tac-toe. This is symbolic AI because he hard-coded how to play a perfect game. But if we jump ahead to 1961 and look at the work of Donald Mishy, we see a scholar develop a program called Menace, and it could play tic-tac-toe through learning. But it wasn't a computer in the modern sense, it was actually a collection of 304 matchboxes. And each matchbox was a state of the game of tic-tac-toe. And if a strategy that was used inside of the matchbox, represented by a bead, was successful, then that strategy remained inside the box. But if it led to a loss, that strategy was removed from the box. And over the course of about 200 generations, or epochs as we call them, it was able to actually play a perfect game of tic-tac-toe. While Donald Mishy's Menace was only in matchbox form, it demonstrated the potential of machine learning. It demonstrated how you could use loss to reiterate across a game to figure out best strategy for winning. And with a simple game like tic-tac-toe, it took 304 matchboxes. Unfortunately, however, in the 1970s, we enter into what Francois Chalet calls the first AI winter, when the promises of the 1950s and 60s were never fully met. They never developed a machine that could think like a human. And as such, research for AI kind of went away. It's going to come back again, however, in the 1980s and the boom in the private industry. And we're going to see private businesses spending billions of dollars and throwing money at AI to try to regain some sort of economic benefit from it. And this is going to lead into a boom in how machine learning and AI can work, specifically with games. Now, in 1991, Chinook has developed, and this program was capable of playing checkers, and it could beat the world reigning champion. Jump ahead again to 1997, and Deep Blue, created by IBM, is able to beat Kasparov, arguably one of the greatest chess masters to ever live. And then, in the early 2000s, we hit another AI winter. Then in 2011, IBM's Watson wins at Jeopardy. And then, this is the big one we need to talk about, in 2016, Google's DeepMind beats a man named Sadal and the most complicated game to exist, and that is the game of Go. Now, in all of these cases prior to Go, AI was symbolic AI, good old-fashioned AI. There were a set of situations in which a computer might find itself in, in checkers or in chess, and it was able to actually create the best strategy based on hard-coded solutions. In 2016, this revolutionizes the field with Google's DeepMind beating Go because this was the first instance of a machine beating a world reigning champion that didn't have any hard-coded instructions. Instead, to beat the world reigning champion in Go, Google trained the computer through past matches and eventually would train a computer by allowing it to play millions of games and learning from its mistakes. This is where we are going throughout the next few videos. This is machine learning. 